So, uh, so when I, so Karen actually uh, contacted me last March. I was actually looking at that back at our emails uh, because uh, uh, a little while ago, uh, uh, I was okay, I'm, I'm giving a, a talk to you all uh, this evening on the 7th. And I, I had to remember what it was that I was supposed to be talking about. Uh, since we had, uh, uh, so, so, uh, so my conception of, of, of what, we had agreed upon is, is, is similar but, but a little bit different than uh, uh, I guess as advertised. Um, we were gonna I, uh, so so my my goal here of uh, um, what I want to talk with you about is is actually just a little bit of teaching with some pretty pictures of, of talking about um, uh, some of the, the major fire maintained natural community types that we have here in, in Southwest Florida. Um, so, uh, so, so if you, uh, if you go out and uh, you have been looking around in, in natural areas, you'll know that there are certain uh, groups of species that hang together, so to speak, uh, that you can, you can see, okay, so uh, we have uh, South Florida slash pine, we have Small palmetto, we have bulberry, um, and we have uh, a number maybe of, of, of grass species. And these species form the repeatable associations. You can see them in your first spot A, but you can go over to, uh, so say that that is in Mickey and Strand, but then you can go over to Gare Island, Big Cypress, and see the same suite of species um, uh, present together. And again, also with some of the same hydrological conditions um, and um, historically what would have been a similar fire regime. So I want to talk about some of these, these different communities so that when you go out and look at, at native plants, um, you know, that it's not just isolated individuals, you know. So, so this is Lyatris spicata. Uh, Lyatris spicata happens to occur uh, in a, a specific kind of niche and, and has some, some repeatable associates. So being able to sort of work out and see kind of the bigger picture of how natural communities are assembled at the plant level uh, is, is what, I'm, what I'm hoping to, to impart. And then, uh, and then what, we're gonna end on scrub, I'll give you that preview. Uh, and then we're gonna be talking about um, a putatively new gold master and uh, chrysopsis molecular phylogeny, molecular evolutionary tree study uh, that I'm doing. So we're going to sort of end on, on that. So some general information uh, and then a little bit about one of the things that, that I've been up to. Okay, so uh, when we think about natural communities, uh, uh, we're thinking about uh, uh, a piece of land. It's not just the, the, the vegetation. I mean, obviously there are a number of vertebrates and invertebrates that are involved, but um, uh, I teach natural communities when I teach my Florisophis Florida class because so much of, of natural, the different types of natural communities and their definitions have to do with the, the vegetation, the plants that grow on. That's absolutely uh, sort of one of the critical defining features of some of these community types. But, but ultimately, there's a number of variables that come into play. So we can think about climate. So there are obviously natural community types that occur on um, Key Largo that you're not going to find uh, in Pensacola. Uh, and that has to do with contrasting climate. So climate is a very uh, is a big variable. Soils are a huge variable. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, um, that just a little bit. Uh, I love soils, and, and uh, in some ways, if you're if you're interested in hunting for a rare plant, uh, a, a soil survey map is sometimes your best friend because oftentimes uh, rare plants are restricted to uh, rare, locally rare soil series. Um, so that can be very helpful to find new localities. Hydrology. Um, so with respect to Inland Peninsular Florida, this is going to mean the position of the water table at various times of the year. So, uh, um, so we're going to talk about how that can vary between the wet and dry season. And, and, and I think as you all know, that that difference can be dramatic. Um, topography. Um, so topography, uh, we obviously in, in Peninsular Florida do not have 
much of the way of topography. If there's anybody here from Colorado, they would be saying topography. <laughs> <in the East." laughs> and laughing under their breath. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, um, there are subtle changes in topography uh, that matter a great deal, especially uh, again with, with this uh, fluctuating water table. And uh, a couple of things can mean the difference. Uh, between uh, areas that uh, are never inundated and areas that are inundated for a couple months or more out of the year. So, so small elevational differences can have a huge effect on, um, on vegetation type. Vegetation structure. So vegetation structure has to do with uh, the, the aspect of the vegetation, whether there's a closed canopy of trees, whether there's an open sparse canopy of trees. So we're going to be seeing most of what we're going to be talking about is about an open canopy of pines or a treeless uh, uh, kind of natural community. Floristic composition. Uh, so again, there are some species that, that uh, tend to be um, very restricted to certain kinds of communities or characterized, distinguish certain kinds of natural community types. Um, and so that becomes important. And then uh, with relevance to uh, some of the communities that we're going to be talking about, not all of Florida's natural communities uh, uh, historically burned, but um, those that we're going to be talking about today um, uh, did historically. So the fire return interval. So what, what historically uh, do people um, estimate? Uh, uh, how, how, what was the, the periodicity of, of burns in terms of once a year, once in five years? Um, so, so these are, are variables to think about. So when we think about Southwest Florida, um, uh, our vegetation, our flora um, is um, partly temperate, partly tropical. So um, historically, especially today, uh, with, with uh, climate change, but historically, even going back to the 40s and 50s, uh, um, our area of Florida was relatively free of hard frost events. So those were, were quite rare. Um, so, uh, so you can see this line here uh, uh, indicates um, uh, no record. So that so if you go down to the keys, there is going to be no uh, killing frost uh, that has been recorded. <coughs> so this is our this line here. Uh, has to do this isotherm has to do with with speed. So uh, uh, so uh, killing frost uh, are between B uh, B and C. So occasional killing frost historically. I mean I, we haven't had a frost in uh, uh, Lee County since I, I moved here uh, four years ago, uh, and I suspect that that probably goes back many years more. Um, so, uh, so needless to say, um, this allows for the, um, uh, the the incursion of elements from the Caribbean to mix with um, both standard coastal plain elements that are common throughout the coastal plain of the southeast, and even some more temperate elements. Um, so we have a, a, an unusual kind of mutt of a flora um, uh, from various um, the hail from various parts. Of, of, of North America and the Caribbean. So another uh, feature of our climate that we need to be aware of uh, is that it is hyper seasonal. So you all living here know this, know that there is a strong contrast between uh, a wet season, which you, we are currently in the midst of. So this is typically happening from um, uh, mid June to uh, I, I will say early October it begins to sort of uh, diminish, at least in the years I've been here, uh, where when we get to late October, where we can be set to be really into the dry season, where there's occasional uh, rain, um, most of that coming from frontal systems from up north, um, as opposed to the afternoon uh, thunderstorms that, that characterize uh, the, the, the wetness of the wet season. So, so this is a climate diagram of Fort Myers. So it's showing, uh, so there's maximum average temperature, minimum average temperature. And here we can see um, uh, precipitation totals per month. So you can see that a preponderance of our precipitation uh, falls. So this is historical averages from, from, from May to October. So, um, 
So at any rate, so uh, we have not had a, uh, a wet season start in May since I've been here, but apparently historically they would it would happen earlier. In the year. Wait, wait, I don't know how to turn this on. I'm sorry. Um, how much of a difference is there between the coast and say 20 miles in front? We'll be able to figure that out. In terms of temperature or in terms of oh. in terms of well, well uh, so, so uh, being close to the coast, uh, cold weather is going to be buffered by the uh, I'm just talking about I teach a plant physiology course. It's one of the courses I teach. And water, it turns out is 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 uh, as of all substances, it takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature of water one degree. Celsius, right. it's, it's, it's heat capacity. So, so areas near the coast are going to be relatively buffered from the extreme. They're going to be moderate because, because they're going to be more moderate. But in moderate. Chicago, with Lake Michigan, you can really notice the difference. Yep. That's why I was wondering about here. So, so uh, if if yeah, I mean, so I, I mean, people who've been long term residents probably have a much more uh, specific knowledge about this than than I do. I mean, has there been Instances where uh, right against the coast that there's been uh, it's been cold, but that there's been no frost event. Where it's 15, 20 miles in, in say near Bakaly, there's been been frost. I mean, so yeah, yeah. So, so 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 that that's that's right. That's that not, not the so 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 that is probably well, it, it's going to affect the plant communities because right close to the coast is where we get um, our most cold sensitive tropical species that are indigenous. Yeah. So, so, so the, um, uh, by and large, there are some isolated uh, uh, hardwood hammocks and big cypress that have a number of tropical species, but a lot of uh, uh, a preponderance of those tropical hammocks that are, 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 are close to the coast and, and, uh, and have, we and they call them survive. maritime hammocks. They wouldn't survive in a mockery or a far east. Um, believe it or not, uh, 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 I'm, some things like uh, I think one species that, that uh, was known to have been killed off by a, uh, a really hard winter freeze that had a wider distribution was um, uh, was Roystonia regia, royal hall. That was that was historically documented to have much wider distribution in, in peninsular Florida, and I forget the year. Um, and I, I, I it was. It was in the if it was in the late 19th century, or early 20th century, but there was a frost event that actually killed off most of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the plants um, from Peninsular Florida. So you can see that today, and you can see it in, in parts of the Everglades, but you can see it uh, in, in the fat hatchy strand and uh, in parts of Big Cypress uh, near the Turner River. There's some um, uh, near Florida 20. There's uh, some some marvelous old individuals. So that's an example uh, where uh, there might have been some buffering temperature close to the coast that that managed to keep those uh, royal palms alive. But uh, but this was in a area many decades era many decades ago when when temperatures were tended to be on the cooler side. So uh, so at any rate so fire. Uh, historically occurring just prior to the wet season. So as uh, afternoon thunderstorms sort of be, be, would begin to, uh, and you from living here might know this, uh, uh, lightning strike season happens uh, right just before the, uh, the afternoon thunderstorms really get going. So there might be some thunderheads that don't produce any rain, but nevertheless produce some lightning strikes and, uh, and um, that's thought historically to have been the source of ignition for a lot of, of fires. Um, uh, when we think about fire in, in the history of Florida's vegetation, as opposed to fire today in, 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 uh, in Florida's vegetation. So, uh, so I just want to, so this is just, uh, um, uh, so here is an example of a, a plant community type um, that is. Uh, uh, Marvelous of uh, the mesic hammock, which in South uh, West Florida is typically called an oak hammock, dominated by lime oak, uh, occurs on mesic soils with occasional to rare fire frequency. So we're going to be talking about 
once every hundred years is, is, is an estimated fire frequency with closed canopies. This is going to be our only uh, plant community type that is characterized by a, a, a closed canopy that we're going to see. I have many more that I could talk about, but I just proved them out at the top um, because we needed to save time. So uh, with, uh, with an understory um, or with dominant uh, trees being live oak and sable palmetto, uh, understory shrubs being uh, collardwood, Mersini cubana. You guys all know. Can I use some some scientific names with impunity here, or, or is that is that is that too much? Sure. With relative to the room. If you want me to stop, so 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 don't feel shy about stopping the proceedings. If you want me to explain something further, or you you said this and I don't know what that is. Uh, let, let me know, and I, I can. Uh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> can you just say the name and then use the Latin? The Latin. Okay, so call so call it wood versus you buy it. And Sarah, no, you guys know softball metal like it's the your 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 long lost cousin. So uh, so so anyway, um, I, this is as much as anything else a plug uh, for. Um, and now I've just pulled out the name of the preserve up in, up in nor northern uh, Lee County. Um, Daniels? Yeah, the Daniels Preserve. It's Spanish Creek. Um, so, so if you want to see uh, uh, one of the very last uh, pieces of virgin music forest, a live oak hammock, the Daniels Preserve is, is really, it's, it's almost shocking in a wonderful way because of how big the trees are. It really does look like that. I think that this, um, in the absence of having any photos of my own, of the, uh, I mean, I've been there and, and stupidly did not take any pictures of, of, the, of, of the vegetation. But anyway, so I think this is printed from their website. But anyway, so, so it's it's a uh, um, it's a true marvel. Just to, just to, it's it's like uh, if you want to get away from it all and have you know this is this is a, a like a mystical kind of experience. Yes. Okay, I'm from Lee County. Where's Daniel's Preserve? The Daniel's Preserve at Spanish Creek is all the way up north uh, towards the Caloosahatchee River. So it's in the, it's in the northeastern part of the county. It's a Lee um, 2020 first oh, okay. preserve. So if you go to the Lee County okay. 2020, yeah. and maybe, I don't, I don't want to hold questions to the <laughs> so, so at any rate, so, so, uh, so uh, a wonderful patch preserve at Dan, the, 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 the Daniel Preserve at Spanish Tree. Okay, so, so that uh, I, I wanted to talk about. Um, so, uh, so that's a little the, sort of the more cursory view of of uh, of, of <laughs> Um Now I want to talk about um, pine flatwoods and dry prairie types. Um, so, so these uh, historically, so these are um, music or what we call hybrid woodland or music shrubland on flat, sandy or limestone substrates, um, uh, and they have a hard pan that impedes drainage. All right, so that's a lot of, 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 of gibberish. We're gonna um, we're gonna unpack that in the next few slides. Uh, but historically, one of the, the features that keeps this open. Uh, um, sort of forest canopy. So the canopy is going to be in Southwest Florida is going to always be South Florida slash pine. Um, and uh, fire uh, will, is thought to occur uh, depending on the kind of, of flatwoods um, uh, on the ballpark of, of every one to uh, five years uh, with maybe a greater frequency for certain of the scrubby flatwoods types. Or, or, or a, um, a greater interval between um, um, fire events. So, um, so what fire will do is it will um, uh, it will basically set back all of the woody plants. Um, so that's one of the major features. So um, we'll talk about how you can you can tell a a, a, a flatwoods that hasn't been burned a long time. Um, and one of the features that you'll, you'll notice is that there, instead of having uh, an herbaceous graminoid cover uh, with uh, interspersed saw palmettos like you see here, so this is from uh, 
flatwoods near a stair river scrub, you'll see that the understory is dominated by shrubs uh, uh, shoulder to shoulder with saw palmetto and essentially no noticeable herbaceous or gramoid understory. Um, so, so, so this uh, high diversity gramoid herbaceous understory uh, is something that is uh, maintained by um, again, sort of relatively frequent burns, at least at least historically. Okay, yes. I just looked up what flat pan meant, and I can only come up with tap one. Yeah. No, <laughs> flat flat was a hard pan. Oh, flat. So, oh, it's hard. What does a hard pan mean? I don't know. Well, we're going to talk about it now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, so. Most of our, our flatland vegetation throughout Florida is on a, 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 a order of soils called spodosols. And uh, uh, without this is a, so there's a, a map of soil types in Florida. And this tan coloration, which you can see is prevalent in our area, is indi indicates the, the range of spodosol soils. So, what is a spodosol soil? Well, a spodosol soil is, uh, is, a, is a soil type. In which, um, uh, by ion exchange, uh, organic acids have accumulated uh, in a layer that's any, uh, anywhere from about a half a meter to a little more than a meter below the surface of the soil, and and so we can see that layer right here is is a, a black line, and above it is is white, looks like ash. Um, so so this is the hard pan that we've been talking about. It, it's a layer of accumulated organic acids, metal, metalloid organic acids, um, that they don't, it doesn't completely impede drainage, but it will slow it down. And, and, uh, and it's very hard for plants to get their roots through this, this spodocarotid is called. So this hard pan layer um, impedes drainage um, it, uh, on, orders of hours, um, not, not on orders of days, um, but, but, it's, but it, 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 it basically impedes root development below this because it's hard enough, it's hard enough that, that most roots can't penetrate. It's only the, the toughest pines uh, and largest shrubs typically can root below this slowly horizon. Um, but as a consequence of this ion exchange, um, all of this, in this case, sand material uh, that is above the spodic horizon becomes leached of, of any nutrient compound. So, um, so basically what you see here is this, this sort of ash white uh, layer, that's just sand. I mean, it's 99 point, um, uh, you know, close to 100% to sand, um, leached, highly weathered because of this chemical weathering process and leached with nutrients. So highly, highly nutrient poor soils, uh, 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 Characterize spodosols. Um, spodos in Greek means ash. Um, sol is, is soil. So, um, so this uh, region above our spodic horizon, the hard pan layer, oftentimes is white or has an ash gray color to it. So that's, that's how the, the series or the, the, the order of soils gets its name, spodosol. So that characterizes uh, flatwoods. Um, so we talked about fire suppression in flatwoods. So in order to maintain uh, the open park-like character of flatwoods habitats, and uh, and thereby also uh, maintaining uh, a number of the, the uncommon to rare species diversity that characterize um, flatwoods uh, vegetation, burn need, burns need to be um, uh, relatively frequent. So, but what happens when? you can go, if you go decades without burning. Well, you see this one of the, the um, in addition to what we talked about, the shrub uh, becoming prevalent and dense, um, uh, the, the palmettas themselves, um, uh, because of being crowded out by um, uh, the shrubs and, and, uh, and hence in competition for life with them, uh, will be, begin going from growing horizontally along the ground to growing vertically. So, so once, once saw palmettos begin to do this, you cannot train them back down uh, to their typical growth form as, as a kind of rhizomatous um, shrub pall. So once, once, so once you have this, this, these erect stems, uh, that, that's it. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know, I have to say, I don't know how you would 
manage beyond that other than, than take out the palmettos and, and start over. Um, but uh, but you're, you know, so these palmettos are stuck growing like this. So, so um, these vertically growing palmettos, uh, which are normally horizontal uh, shrubs, are, is, is one uh, kind of another clue for um, knowing that you're in a very fire suppressed flat waste. Okay, so um, the, um, on the spectrum of, of hydrology, we can place flatwood from scrubby to mesic to wet. Uh, so we're gonna talk about this spectrum of flatwood types, uh, beginning with the dry end of scrubby flatwoods. Uh, so, uh, uh, so these are flatlands with a typically spodosol substrate. Does that, if anybody knows their soil series, oftentimes with a mockley, Series photosol is, is uh, the soil that will um, uh, sort of support scrubby flatwoods. Um, so, uh, so it's common statewide, particularly in the central part of the peninsula, uh, and uh, is a imperiled kind of, of natural community type in South Florida. So, uh, when on your trip uh, this weekend to railhead scrub, in addition to true scrub, you'll also see some areas uh, that qualify as, uh, as scrubby flatwoods. And we'll talk about how to tell, tell those apart in, in a moment. Um, uh, so, uh, so we see, uh, so when you look at a, at a scrubby flatwoods, you're gonna see widely scattered South Florida's slash pines. You're going to see um, a, a number of oak species that are actually going to be in common with those in the scrub. So, so there's a trio of oaks, the sand live oak, the myrtle oak, and Chapman's oak um, that are our scrub oaks. And they're present in scrubby flatwoods as they are in scrub. Um, uh, however, we're going to see uh, in scrubby flatwoods, one of the major contrasts in terms of looking at the vegetation um, is that there is uh, 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 relatively little. There's going to be some open bare patches of sand, uh, but there's going to be a much greater density of graminoid and herbaceous plants uh, in between the individual plants um, in, in the community. So as we're going to see, we're actually going to end on scrub. When I talk to, about this with students, we usually begin with scrub, but we're going to end on scrub. Um, so uh, scrub will have many, many more open areas with bare patches of soil or uh, bare patches of, of, of sand, often covered with lichens. So an increased um, level of, of herbaceous and graminoid uh, diversity and cover is one of the defining features that differentiate, differentiates it from, 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 uh, from scrub. Also, this, uh, this species here, you guys know this, uh, this is tar flower, the hairy racemosa. Uh, typically, a scrub is just a little bit too uh, uh, xeric for it to be able to thrive. However, it's the cornerstone species of scrubby flatwoods. Um, so, so that's another good species to look out for uh, to know that you're in scrubby flatwoods and um, as opposed to uh, as opposed to scrub. Um, and in terms of some some more. Uh, Niche specific species. Um, you guys know Kara Driscoll. She's working on this milkweed, uh, the uh, Florida milkweed, the Sleepia stei, uh, which has a narrow niche restricted to scrubby flatwoods. So, this is a scrubby flatwood specialist. Uh, and also, uh, this little October flower, um, our version of October flower has got these really skinny leaves. Um, so it's it considered variety Brachystapia polygonella, polygonella variety Brachystapia uh, is another uh, specialist in scrub flatwoods. So we have some, some her, um, showy herbaceous species um, that, that are specialists of, of, of scrub flatwoods. Uh, and um, those of you who know a little bit about me know that I love grasses and sedges and although so, 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 so this is this is this is as bad as it gets. So, 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 so fret not. Here, but, I, but I'm just gonna like I'm gonna make them look at one slide of grasses and said it's just it's like eating your weedies, you know, it'll, it'll make you tougher. Um, so there there are some unusual grasses. I mean, so this is a a, a, a recent split off of um, uh, of an andropogon that. Um, uh, 
so uh, what, what do I want to say? So, so this is a recently recognized species uh, in Peninsula, Florida, Andropogon cumuliculum, that is a scrubby flatwood specialist. So here, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the, the folks at Astera River Scrub burned a parcel of their land, and lo and behold, after the burn, uh, there were thousands of plants of Andropogon cumuliculum. So, so a, a rare species. Um, so it's 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 a peninsular variant, a recent segregate species from Andropogon arctavis, which maybe if you guys know your graph, it's a panhandle species grows in in sort of wet areas like pitcher plant bogs. So so this is uh, um, recently recognized that's about five or six years ago. And then uh, beach sedges. So those of you who have been uh, looking at Rabinoids in Florida know that Rincospora, the beet sedges, are, are one of our major sedge genera. And so the, the scrubby flatwoods have got their own uh, rather niche specific beet sedge, Rincospora uh, pileticola, um, that is uh, a relative of. Does anybody here know their beet sedges or care about their beet sedges? <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll slow move on. <laughs> Beak sedges. sedges. So, so, so a plug for beak sedges, they're the, the keens, which are the fruits which, which you use to identify them, are some of the most marvelous objects of art that nature produces on, when you see them under the microscope. They're just gorgeous. So if you like looking at stuff under the microscope and that are highly ornate, <laughs> the keens of Rincosper species are showstoppers. What if you don't have a microscope? Uh, you can use a hand lens and at least get, get some of their mojo. <laughs> okay, so music flatwoods um, uh, would have had much more frequent fire and uh, would have uh, historically burned every two to four years. So this is uh, an estimate by the folks at the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. Uh, scrum flatwood burning um, uh, estimates of at their fire frequency, um, uh, they burn less often than music flatwoods. It oftentimes burn in a patchy way. Music flatwoods burning relatively frequent. That's a fairly high fire frequency relative to, you know, if you think about that in a, on a whole United States level, that's, that's, <clears throat> that this is just a very pyrogenic vegetation type. Um, so uh, uh, again, with an open canopy and um, uh, of South Florida slash pine, uh, and then a characteristic assembly or assemblage of sort of plant of sh shrub stature, which we're going to include salt palmetto, but then also proper shrubs uh, like uh, goldberry, dwarf live oak, coastal plain staggerbush in Southwest Florida is, is, is another big one. And then to top it all off and to add the fuel to the fire, literally we have wire grass, uh, which occurs to an extent in scrubby flatwoods, but really uh, is one of the dominant granoid species, Aristida babrichiana is the, the southern wire grass. Um, uh, so uh, uh, if you go up, in, in, if you were to, if we were actually standing, uh, in this uh, piece of vegetation, and we're going to go out and look at some of these grassy areas, we'd see that a lot of the, um, the, the grasses were actually uh, going to be the risk of the baby gain of wild grass. So, so, so it happens to be really good at, uh, at carrying fire, very, very uh, inflammable grass. Yes? Do any of these plants require the flies to prepare the seeds for germination? Not to prepare the seeds for germination, um, there are a number of uh, flatwood species. I should have included some, some images of, of them, uh, but, uh, but there's a number of flatwood species and particularly some of the orchids that require fire to bloom. So, so they, uh, their, their blooming is fire dependent. So, uh, so the, the multi-flower um, uh, rose pink Calipogon multiflorus is one is a, is a rare orchid species that has blooms that are tied to uh, fire beds. Another species that is uh, occurs in Lee and Charlotte counties is the beautiful pawpaw, uh, a simina uh, pulchella. So it's a little, it's a, let's, you know, guys know the um, uh, 
net pop bottle, the seminar reticulata. So that, that's about knee high. Uh, uh, so this is an ankle high little paw paw. Uh, and it has this gorgeous, this very large white flower for the size of the plant, but it will only bloom after fire. So, so there's a number of species that are, uh, that instead of not, not, they don't fruit in relation to fire or need, need fire to actually set fruit, or, but, they, but they need fire to, to actually flower and then set fruit. So maybe that, does that answer your question? <clears throat> no, I just read that some uh, seeds, they need the heat. Oh, you yes, okay, so, so, so you have an Australian accent. And so, 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 uh, so yeah, so, so there's a, so to what extent do you, are there some seeds that will hang out in the seed bank and they need chemicals from smoke in order to germinate? That, 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 that's, so, so in the Australian flora, particularly the West Australian flora, that's a big deal. There's a number of, of species that have, uh, they, they need smoke in order to, to the, the chemicals from smoke that dissolve into water in order to germinate. Um, so, uh, and so uh, as far as I know, that, that isn't the case here. Um, and I, I think part of it has to do with the fact that um, uh, fires were historically so frequent. So in Australia, I don't think that, I mean, except for some of the grasslands in, in the northern part of, of, the, of the continent um, that would have burned almost yearly, uh, the <clears throat> more Mediterranean kind of shrubland burned on the order of decades. Uh, so, so here, th there's such a, a high frequency of fire. I, I think it just it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. So, so there, with decades uh, between burn, plants will 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 set fruit and drop their seeds. If the seeds will get dispersed, but it's not going to be favorable them to germinate until there's a fire. So the fire then, uh, after a couple decades, there's a fire, and then that smoke gets um, combined with water into a solution that then the, the seed can pick up on as a, an environmental cue to say, aha, there's been a fire, time to germinate. So here, it happens so so commonly um, that, that that is not been a, a, a mechanism that, that characterizes our plants. It is um, so... Um, so at any rate, so so in music flatwoods, we begin to sort of begin to pick, pick up uh, a, a number of real showstopper species uh, that uh, I think everyone loves to see, including myself. I go the god off for this one. This is uh, Carpeferous carnosus. Um, so uh, if you haven't done so, go up. I mean, I know this is Collier County. I love Collier County. It's currently my, my, my favorite botany spots are in Collier County. But Badcock Web has got some pretty nice areas too. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, uh, that there are some species that uh, are sort of central peninsular species that get into Charlotte County and don't make it down here. And this is one of them. So you're going to have to go up to Babcock Web to see this one. And this photo doesn't do it justice. Uh, it's got these intense purple flowers, but the, the essence of purple has been put into the um, into those um, flowering heads. So Carpeferous carnosus, uh, we have um, uh, uh, we're going to be seeing this uh, in Collier County, but all throughout Southwest Florida soon in, in, in uh, Mesic Flatwoods, Sorgastrum secundum. Uh, the uh, the lopsided uh, Indian grass, um, so so that that is, is always a favorite. Doesn't last long, but when it when it's doing its thing, it's just it's just a beaut. Um, and uh, uh, I guess this is uh, again my love of andropogons. Uh, the andropogons and rancospras um, are cool because they will tell you a lot about uh, what the plant community type is and what the soil type is. Um, so so these are. There's a lot of anapogon species, there's a lot of beet sedge species, uh, but the way that they're partitioned into the landscape are often very niche specific, um, and are some of the species can be, and, and, and so that's a, a marvel to be able to see. So here's one uh, that likes those sort of little wet dips in, in music flatwoods, anapogon cretaceous, one of the, the, um, the, the sort of um, bluish kind of, of blue stems. Uh, so not all of them have <coughs> bluish waxy coating, but that one uh, does. Okay, wet flatwoods. Okay, so um, as opposed to uh, what we saw with the scrubby and music flatwoods, 
the, during the, the height of the wet season, the water table in wet flatwoods will actually uh, come up above the soil surface. So wet flatwoods um, uh, contrast with the other flatwood types in that they are seasonally inundated at least for a couple of weeks. Um, so uh, seasonally inundated. Uh, so this occurs uh, statewide, uh, various kinds of, of, of permutations in wet flatwoods. Again, with a high fire frequency, uh, that is one estimate, it will say two to four years. I've seen estimates of some people say yearly, um, but, you know, um, but at any rate, so high fire frequency. Uh, and um, again, uh, in terms of the physiognomy of the vegetation, um, uh, very like uh, a, a music flatwood, so there's an open pine canopy uh, typically, we, we miss out on some of the ericaceous shrubs, uh, some of the, um, uh, the stagger bushes, the lionias, some of the, 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 the small vaccine species. Um, uh, but there is a huge diversity of, of graminoids and herbs. And so uh, some of the highest <laughs> diversity um, species richnesses at, at fine scales, so say meter square. You, 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 have a, you take four meter sticks together and make a grid and you plot it down and you do an exercise where you try to catalog all the species within that meter square. So, so people who are vegetation scientists, plant colonists do this and they've done this on all over the world and done this kind of, a, a, of, a, of an exercise. And, um, and so some of the highest herbaceous diversities at these fine scales of, of exceeding 100 species per, per, per uh, square meter um, uh, are found in, in wet flatwoods in the panhandle and in uh, uh, wet flatwoods in the green swamp of southeastern North Carolina. So, so, uh, so these are some, these are have an, an enormously high um, uh, herbaceous diversity and also uh, a number of again, niche specific species that happen to be rare and, and some of them quite showy. So again, this is uh, uh, so these are some species from from wet flatwoods and Badcock web. This is the uh, uh, Sporanthes longulabris. So this is uh, our largest flowered uh, true Sporanthes species. I think this is the most handsome one. Um, I, I have a colleague who calls it uh, November tresses because they're Thanksgiving tresses because it, it oftentimes blooms right around Thanksgiving time. So instead of ladies tresses, Sporanthes are called ladies tresses. This is a Thanksgiving ladies tress, so it's a Thanksgiving tress. Anyway, uh, so um, so and then uh, this large flowered milkweed uh, has its southernmost distribution down to Charlotte County, uh, and this is a real showstopper of a milkweed species. Uh, and you should definitely go try to see it if you haven't. It's just these marvelously bizarre flowers um, that are about an inch long. Uh, one that, that, that uh, uh, you guys are seeing, I see iNaturalist observations coming up from Collier County. This is a species that uh, is mostly in southern peninsular Florida in, um, and uh, uh, was thought to be endemic until it was discovered uh, a decade or so ago in Bermuda. But anyway, this is Lyatris garbari. So, uh, Connie, I know that you took a picture of this just recently. Um, so, so a lot of the blazing stars, Lyatris uh, species, look very similar, uh, but this one uh, um, is distinctly different when you actually pull the plant up and examine the below ground storage structure. So in all the, the other Lyatris species, all other Lyatris species have a more or less spherical or uh, spheroidal kind of uh, below ground persistent structure. Lyatris garbari alone has got these sort of linear uh, rhizome-like persisting uh, underground persisting structures. So this is uh, uh, a, a common species in our area, uh, but uh, but it, it tends to like uh, pinelands that have got a little bit of influence of limestone uh, in the soil. And so those kinds of, of, of pinelands happen to be particularly common in Southwest Florida and not very common elsewhere in the state. So, so, we, so this is something that we have um, in some abundance, but it's not common elsewhere in the state. Another pair of species that like uh, these calcareous pinelands 
Uh, and we're going to they're called carriers uh, because of ion exchange. We're going to talk about that property in just a moment. Uh, so it turns out when you put the water table above the soil level for a couple of weeks, it does something funky with the pH and chemistry of the soil. Uh, but, but here are two other uh, highland calcifiles. This is uh, both are, are relatively rare, um, but, but not that uncommon in our area. One is Ravenel's pipework, which area called Ravenelii, um, which is our only annual species of pipework. So we can find this in, in uh, kind of the ecotone between wet flatwoods and, and uh, moral prairies. And then this is the fringe bladderwort. So this is a real showstopper. It has got these gorgeous red eyelash fringed bracts. That, that, and, and there's nothing else. There's either, so bladderworts. Um, are actually kind of, can be kind of tough to figure out to species, um, but, but this one is totally unique and totally stands out with these eyelash fringe, fringe bracts. So this is the fringe bladderwort utricularia simulant. So both of these uh, are species that go in October. Um, so, uh, so, so you can have a, a look for those in, in, uh, coming up in a few weeks. Um, and then um, kind of moving on to, uh, 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 other community types, uh, I just want to talk about um, if, if we take the wet flatwoods and we increase the higher period from weeks to a couple of months, um, more or less, we can wind up with uh, a vegetation type that is a wet prairie. So by increasing the higher period, uh, this precludes the development of a lot of woody plants. So wet prairies, as the name prairie suggests, tend to be treeless. So the high hydro period, um, so the fact that the, the soils are inundated, um, plant, plant cells need oxygen, just like we need oxygen. And so if plants are developing well, roots under, under, under soil, and the soil is underwater, uh, that is a limiting factor for plant growth. It turns out a lot of our woody plants cannot cope with that. So, so hence, uh, high water, uh, uh, high hydro period areas tend to be devoid of, of any trees. Um, so, so this is uh, our kind of wet prairie in Southwest Florida. Uh, is has a uh, uh, calcareous influence that I'll talk about in just a second. But one of the grass species uh, that that characterizes characterizes it is you can see all this pink foam here. This is the uh, the Gulf uh, uh, muley, uh, Muhlenbergia sericea. So these are the inflorescences of it. So here is a, a spot of, of calcareous wet prairie uh, and Muhlenbergia sericea. Um, and so uh, how does it get calcareous? Well, it turns out that when the water table goes above the soil surface, there are all kinds of um, microorganisms and, and uh, planktonic algae that will grow on, 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 the, on the, uh, the combs of grasses and anything that they can grow on. It will, it will grow what is called a paraphyton layer. Um, and uh, so, so these uh, paraphyton organisms are growing on our, our grasses um, and um, one other feature that happens when the, the uh, so this allows for them to grow. Another feature that happens when the water table uh, rises above the soil surface is it allows for ions from, um, from, uh, from basically subsurficial deposits of calcium carbonate um, get dissolved and can make their way up and have continuity now, not just within the soil column itself, but, but above it into the water level. And so these paraphyton uh, organisms will precipitate that the calcium ions out. And so this has happened year after year, millennia, millennia. And so we can, we can see this, this process. So here are the paraphyton growing. Uh, and and uh, when we look at them in the dry season, uh, we can note that they have, they look like lime deposits right on the soil surface. So, so these areas uh, of, of wet calcareous flatwoods, wet uh, pra calcareous prairies, uh, so they have, uh, these, they develop a paraphyton 
that will, that will precipitate out calcium ions from sort of a, a water column extending or uh, um, basically all the way to the calcium carbonate bedrock or marl deposits that, that underlie the soil. So over, over many millennia, this has changed the pH of the soil and has made it more circumneutral to calcareous rather than acidic, which is, which is typical of, of most highland soils. So, so this is a phenomenon that is uh, these calcareous uh, pinelands and wet prairies, um, super rare in the southeastern United States, uh, but, but much more common in South Florida, particularly Southwest Florida for the pinelands. So we have a sort of a unique vegetation type. And so there are some rare species. This is uh, um, uh, Elytraria caroliniensis, uh, with a, a endemic variety that has narrow leaves and gristifolia, that means uh, narrow leaves in Latin. Uh, and then uh, depression marshes. So um, I'm actually, uh, so let's, uh, so, so depression marshes are a bit like prairies, however, um, here's an aerial photo of Babcock Web. We can see that they are bounded, delimited uh, depressions in, in a pineland landscape. So we can see, um, so, so these are seasonally inundated um, uh, treeless open areas, and they've got their own characteristic kind of plants. So they're dominated by graminoids, but there can be some very showy wildflower species. This is the tall polygula, polygula cymosa, uh, which uh, again, it occurs up at Babcock Web, where it reaches its southern limit in, in uh, Peninsula, Florida. So, uh, so depression marshes also mm -hmm. characterize um, Southwest Florida. And then uh, big areas of, of, of our alligator flag too. So you guys know that plant. Okay, so scrub. Uh, so scrub uh, occurs in areas, um, upland areas with deep sand substrate. Um, so, so the water table is never going to get anywhere near the soil surface. So, so when you go, guys, go to railhead scrub, um, and railhead scrub, uh, uh, the, the highest, driest areas at the, the height of the wet, wet season, the water table is going to get no further than about four feet below the, 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 the soil surface. So, so that's the height of the highest water table four feet below the soil surface. So, so the plants growing at, at the soil surface in the really high and dry areas have got to root down four feet just to get the water table at its maximum during the wet season. So, um, so at any rate, so we'll talk a little bit about, more about the soil, but, but anyway, so very, um, so the sands are excessively draining. Uh, so this is uh, the most water limited environment ecosystem um, community type of, of, of all inland uh, Florida community types. Um, uh, so fire is occasional to rare. Um, there's some debate amongst fire ecologists as to just how frequently scrub burn, uh, but there's some people that will say commonly batted around range is five to, to 20 years, oftentimes burnt in, in, in a patchy distribution uh, where parts of a given scrub will, will burn and parts of it won't. Um, so um, when scrub does burn, it burns extremely hot uh, because there's a very high fuel load. Um, and so uh, in terms of the, of the species that characterize the, 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 the Florida scrub, um, there are, there's first off, Florida rosemary. So you guys, you guys know Serratiola heracoides, Florida rosemary. Yes, no. So, 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 so it looks a lot like culinary rosemary. It's a little bush, uh, maybe you can get to about a meter high, uh, and, uh, and, and has small needle-like leaves. And there's some of there's some granola in the scrub that is uh, off uh, on the garden trails. So, so you should have, a, if you haven't done so, go out and, and have a look. You'll see some plant that, that looks like culinary rosemary, but it's not, and doesn't smell like it, and that's Serratiola. So Serratiola, um, so, so that is uh, uh, one of the most drought resistant shrubs uh, that, that uh, exist in, in, in Florida. So in the highest and driest shrubs uh, on the Lake Wales Ridge uh, have nothing but Serratiola. Uh, so, uh, so then there is a, a company Serratiola, there is a trio of oak species. 
uh, myrtle oak, Quercus myrtifolia, chap oak, Quercus <laughs> chap on it, and sand live oak, Quercus geminata, uh, that uh, 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 sort of round out the, um, the shrub layer of, of the vegetation. So, uh, so scrubby flatwoods uh, are too wet to support ceratiola. So, so, so this is really, when we see Florida rosemary, ceratiola, we know where we've got scrub. I mean, so that's a, 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 an indicator species for, for that, for this natural community type. So uh, between these islands of shrubs, um, uh, there are large, uh, essentially bare patches of soil uh, and here, uh, um, life is pretty harsh. I mean, so if you were to go out in, say, late May, uh, when sunlight is intense, um, and you put your hand on the soil surface at, say, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it burns. It's like, it's like 50 or 60 degrees Celsius. Hot. Um, so this is a, a rather inhospitable environment for, for organisms to grow. but, but um, uh, several lichen species have really made a, uh, um, a remarkable go at it. Um, so members of the genus Caledonia. Um, so here are two species. Here is one. It's kind of hard to see. Um, it sort of looks, it's a, it's a flat species. Uh, and they sometimes call it the cottage cheese lichen um, uh, because it, uh, um, so uh, it has a remarkable uh, ability to basically turn into a ball, like a resurrection, like one of the Salaginella resurrection plants, and show its, its white undersurface when it's really dry. And when there's a rainstorm, it will basically flatten out and expose, it, expose some bad part of its cortex. Okay, so we've got, and then we've got other kind of lichens that are, this is the oak toast lichen that everyone loves, Cladonia vancii. Um, so uh, uh, lichens are susceptible to being destroyed by fire. Um, so fires um, can have, um, although important, um, uh, you have to be careful to, uh, to make sure that some uh, lichen patches remain so that you don't wipe out all the lichens in a given area. Okay, so the, the kind of soils that, that characterize scrub are called anthosols. That's the order of soils. Uh, that characterize entosols. So here we can see the extent of entosols in, in Florida. And they're oftentimes thought to be young soils because they lack any of the diagnostic horizons that uh, occur by weathering soils. So, so, so these are soils that are just basically, in the case of our, uh, of our scrub soils, it's just sand from the soil surface all the way down, just sand. Um, so there's no uh, uh, what soil biologists or soil uh, morph, uh, scientists would call uh, morphology. These, 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 the development of these characteristic horizons development, just sand. Um, and uh, we can see that Peninsula Florida has got a lot of anthosols. Uh, and uh, most of what you're seeing here, at least in central Peninsula Florida, this is, uh, these are anthosols that are associated with, with uh, uh, scrub vegetation, at least it would have been historically. Uh, what we're, we have going on down here is something entirely different having to do with this being very geologically young. But despite the fact that these soils, um, the, the scrub entosols, uh, despite the fact that, that they um, are relatively young in terms of having no uh, differentiation into diagnostic horizons, they are intensely weathered and hence very nutrient poor. So, so these are hot, well-draining soils. Uh, so the communities are, are have a hot daytime high temperature uh, in, in May and June, uh, uh, and uh, well-draining soils that are nutrient poor. So this poses a lot of challenges to, to what plants can grow. So when you go out to railhead scrub on Saturday, uh, think about that, that these are plants that, that, that are, uh, have to exist perhaps without much contact with water for months uh, because they're growing in extremely uh, well-drained soils and, and it doesn't rain. Um, and then uh, to top it all off, not only do they have to deal with drought stress, these soils are incredibly nutrient poor. So it turns out, so, so if you wonder why there's all of these uh, the shrubs have got these really tough, small leaves, um, those happen to be features, morphological features of leaves uh, that evolve in plants that grow in areas that have 
uh, experience periodic drought and have growing really nutrient poor soils. Okay, so uh, scrubs in Southwest Florida. So, uh, so here uh, uh, is a, a map showing uh, two soil series, uh, the satellite series, Archbold series. Um, how am I doing on time? Because I can, should I? Okay. Um, so, so, so we're we're so we're we're getting into so we're going to now transition from talking about just general pet community types. We're going to talk about scrubs in Southwest Florida and quickly go over to Chrysopsis. Um, so, so at any rate, so scrubs in Southwest Florida, we can see um, our uh, their area of extent. Uh, we can see in that little purple box. But more broadly, um, the colored areas on this map uh, show the extent of two soil series, the, the satellite series and the archbold series that are common scrub soil series. Uh, so you can see that, uh, um, so here's the Lake Wales Ridge here. So you can see that it comes out pretty clearly. Uh, so in, in the central part of the peninsula. And then uh, in Southwest Florida, we have got this little ridge uh, uh, here, so this area of satellite soils, uh, and it occurs right where they uh, developed US 41. And that's no access because this was the highest and driest area. So if you're if you are a traffic engineer, you want to build a road that doesn't flood uh, and uh, nobody's stopping you, build it on a uh, sandwich because that's going to uh, prevent a, a lots of problems and prevent all kinds of repairs being, made, being needed to be made to your road. So, so at any rate, so we have this, uh, um, this, uh, this sandwich of which uh, that once supported uh, a great deal of scrub, uh, I'm, or so I'm told, it supported scrub jay populations. Uh, so our South Florida scrub, uh, uh, Southwest Florida scrub had uh, a population of scrub jay. That's no longer uh, the case. Um, and so uh, um, uh, I want to turn to talking about a, a genus of plants of Chrysopsis, which are colloquially called the gold masters. And, uh, and uh, Chrysopsis happens to be one of the genera plants that are, are, are scrub specialists. So they are a natural evolutionary lineage. Um, so that's been assessed with molecular phylogenetic information, so DNA sequence information. Uh, that has been analyzed uh, in various ways, but also is diagnosed morphologically by um, some technical features of, of hair. So Chrysopsis uh, is, uh, um, is most species rich in Florida. So the genus as a whole in, is endemic to Eastern North America. Uh, uh, so there are nine species in total, seven of which are endemic to Florida. And several of these Florida endemic species are confined or have uh, narrow distributions, what we call our endemics, to, uh, to some of these sand ridges. So there's a, a number of these. Uh, so we talked about our sand ridge, but um, more famous and more prominent are a number of these north-south oriented inland sand ridges uh, that are thought to be derived from, from ancient dunes. So these are the main areas that will support Florida scrub vegetation. So again, uh, so, so going back, we have our scrub ridge is, is relatively limited in size, but geographically quite distinct and isolated from any of the other scrub ridges, right? So, so it's, it's quite a ways away from, from, uh, uh, from any other nearby similar habitat. So, uh, in terms of what is left of our Southwest Florida scrub ridge, the very finest piece you are going to get to see on Saturday, which is railhead scrub. Um, so, uh, so this is the, the only large uh, reserve that, that uh, protects um, uh, a large or a large extent of Florida scrub in, in Southwest Florida. So here's a picture. So here you can see uh, these areas that have where you can see the white sand uh, is dissecting the vegetation. Uh, that is, uh, all of this is, is scrub vegetation. Uh, and uh, Kara Driscoll, who is, uh, I think, a member of, of this chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society, uh, uh, I'm on her master's committee. 
And when I, uh, a year or two into, uh, after I arrived, Tara uh, took me here because she was like, well, I, there is this Chrysopsis here, Jay, and it's fuzzy and, and, and it's new. And, and I don't know, you know, so she, she kept, so, so, so I, I couldn't really kind of make heads or tail of it, but, but she said, she, she, one time we were out and, and she just, okay, we're gonna go to Railhead Scrub. So, so I, we drove over to Railhead Scrub and, um, and uh, what, I, what I saw was, 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 was pretty amazing. So, so at any rate, so, uh, so she noted this, this population of gold masters. So here um, is uh, sort of this mystery Chrysopsis. So here is our railhead scrub Chrysopsis. So, uh, so one of the features that, that is um, genuinely uh, interesting about it is that the stem leaves are densely tomentose. Um, so stem leaf pubescence characters are, are, um, are sort of big, important characters for species delimitation in, in Chrysopsis. So, so she was on to something. So this, so, uh, um, so this plant uh, uh, was growing, uh, it was actually blooming weirdly in, in May. The first time it was there was in May, there was, there was in, in the month of May, and there were still some individuals that were blooming that was also weird. We'll talk about why that's interesting uh, in just a moment, but, but, uh, uh, but other workers uh, mostly had ignored this or, or not particularly cared about its unusual features and thought it was this species here, Chrysopsis scabrella, so here is uh, a Chrysopsis scabrella. So you can see that, that its leaves have, um, uh, they, they have uh, hairs on them, but they're, they have a, a glandular pubescence and they lack these, those white woolly hairs um, that we see here in our railhead Chrysopsis. So, uh, um, so I wanted to get to the bottom of this. And so uh, I started with a, a kind of a limited uh, molecular phylogenetic investigation uh, with some FTCU students. Uh, and uh, so uh, got a hold of some populations of, of Chrysopsis scabrella um, uh, and, uh, and sequenced those as well as, as railhead, as the railhead Chrysopsis. Uh, but just to, to, to uh, kind of outline some hypotheses, I mean, so we're, you know, could this be a new species and, and how would we be able to tell that with the data? Well, uh, one hypothesis uh, could be is that uh, Chrysopsis scabrella, all of our, our uh, populations of <clears throat> Chrysopsis scabrella could form a natural unit and, um, and basically have uh, a divergence with railhead. So railhead is not part of Chrysopsis scabrella, but is the most recently diverged species, shares a, a sister relationship with Chrysopsis scabrella. So that, um, and that's evidence that, uh, that the two could be possibly distinct. Um, if we, uh, in our phylogeny, we found that the railhead chrysopsis was not closely related to scrapella at all, but in fact, other chrysopsis, then that would really suggest that it was distinct. However, if we found that the railhead chrysopsis was kind of nested uh, among the uh, populations of chrysopsis scrapella, then this uh, uh, result might suggest that the railhead chrysopsis with just an unusual morphotype of, 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 of the, the railhead chrysopsis with just an unusual morphotype of chrysopsis scabrella. Uh, it really shouldn't be considered uh, taxonomically distinct. So we extracted the DNA and amplified some, uh, some typically used molecular markers to address these kind of questions and did uh, created a phylogeny. Um, and uh, we found that uh, uh, the railhead chrysopsis was indeed sister to the other uh, accessions of Chrysopsis scabrella. Uh, these are from Southwest Florida. Uh, and that the railhead Chrysopsis and uh, uh, Chrysopsis scabrella um, sort of larger grouping um, was sister to or shared a most recent common ancestor with a species from the Lake Wales Ridge called Chrysopsis highlandensis. So this does not reject uh, uh, sort of uh, this railhead Chrysopsis being taxonomically distinct or, or more recognized as, as a species 
uh, that uh, we wanted to, to look at, at some of this further. Um, so when we actually put uh, our railhead chrysopsis um, the side by side with typical Chrysopsis scabrella, and then in this species, which I've indicated with the green arrow here and in green text, Chrysopsis hyalindensis. We can see that, in fact, it kind of almost seems to share features of both. I mean, so it's got this, this uh, wavy margins that are similar to Scabrella. Um, but like Hylandensis, Hylandensis is one of the species that has the woolly white hairs on the leaves. So, so it, it has both of those features. Um, so this was, uh, 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 so, uh, so in some ways, th this placement, this phylogenetic placement for the railhead chrysopsis made some sense in terms of these leaf characteristics that are, again, important for understanding chrysopsis diversity. Um, so uh, when we got to, to looking at, at uh, the railhead chrysopsis, so here's a, a picture of it uh, from one of my uh, students. Um, uh, it's a great photographer. I've actually got a couple that are, are great photographers. But uh, uh, when we went out in the fall, uh, so chrysopsis are typically October blooming. So we went out to railhead scrub in October, and no plants were blooming at all. So that's when chrysopsis scrubella blooms, blooms in mid October. No plants were blooming. Turns out that the plants don't bloom until January, which is one of the reasons why it's overlooked because who goes, not, not many botanists are out sort of uh, um, on the prowl in, in, in January looking to collect plants. So, so, so these plants are, are reproductively isolated from Chrysopsis scrubella by, by due to the fact uh, uh, that their uh, peak bloom is at least six weeks later uh, than those of, of Chrysopsis scabrella. So, so it's a very distinctive uh, blooming period. So uh, in addition to railhead, there are two more extant populations that were discovered within a couple kilometers of, of railhead scrub and some, some very small little, little pieces of tub scrub. Um, and, so, uh, and so it's not a single site endemic either. Um, so, 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 so at any rate, so, uh, so uh, with some honor students in, a, in my uh, Florida Southwest Florida class, we, we made some morphological me uh, measurements of the railhead chrysopsis, but also I had students who were interested in, in characterizing its niche. So we did um, some studies looking at uh, uh, distance to the, the, to the nearest woody plant to, to, to understand its kind of um, where it fits into the structure of the vegetation at railhead scrub. And, uh, um, and you know, character did, did some vegetation plots. Um, so we know a bit about that. So again, uh, the satellite fine sands uh, um, are, are uh, characteristic of, of, of uh, the soil of, of for which this high chrysopsis grows. And here you can see this is another picture of railhead <coughs> scrub. Um, but uh, this is actually the, the soil gazette map. And so you can see sort of everything within this, within this uh, polygon here, this weirdly shaped polygon, that's all gazetted as satellite time sand. So, um, so at any rate, so, uh, so at the moment, um, the synthesis of evidence uh, suggests that this railhead chrysopsis enemy appears to be taxonomically distinct. Uh, I remain sort of skeptical, so I've actually, um, I'll, I'll mention in a minute, kind of expanded this project uh, slightly. The basis for the endemism is unclear. So did this evolve in situ within its narrow range, um, or is this uh, a, a species that was once more widespread and then went extinct elsewhere in its range is only present now uh, in Southwest Florida. So that's something that, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> We may not be able to uh, know for sure, but but um, but putting this in a large uh, phylogenetic evolutionary tree context and doing some fancy analyses can can shed some light on it. So um, so uh, uh, so last spring we developed some new molecular markers uh, based on uh, comparisons of whole chloroplast genomes of, of relatives, uh, and so we're currently uh, involved in in. Uh, 
more species sampling outside of uh, Chrysopsis scabrella and railhead to try to it, develop a full molecular phylogeny of, of, uh, of, of Chrysopsis. So, um, so at any rate, so so you guys will uh, can, can maybe take part in a conservation assessment someday if if we uh, give this the green light. So it's a kind of, it's a really cool cool little uh, project that is right on our doorstep. Uh, involving a wonderful little gem of, of a piece of a natural land, uh, natural area. And so there's a lot of people I would like to thank. So, um, so for the initial molecular phylogenetic data, uh, some colleagues in Maryland who uh, shared some unpublished IPS, uh, that's a molecular marker, uh, DNA sequence data so that we would have some better context for, for our uh, data, Kara Driscoll, uh, for for um, uh, you know being my partner in crime and, and bringing this to my attention, a uh, uh, number of students from from research students to honor students and in courses um, have uh, uh, have all pitched in to help. Molly Duvall, who I think maybe you'll meet on on Saturday, uh, gave us permission to to access Railhead Scrub and Jen Mauser uh, uh, to help with uh, um, some. Uh, Technical support or is supplied, and, and she is uh, awesome and, and just just tremendous uh, uh, asset to the department. So, so from there, um, uh, thank you very much. I mean, that was kind of a, a weird pairing. I tried to go you know, nat natural committee, bend on scrub, and then talk about uh, a little bit about my research. Um, so, um, so I hope you guys enjoyed that and. Uh, Who's stimulating? Who's stimulating? Yeah. 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 This is how I'm going to get a scientist. I'm trying to, I'm sorry it was too, don't, 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 if it was too much science and not enough. No, no, no. Um, increase my vocabulary. Uh, <laughs> and I'm trying to like minimize the terms. <laughs> what, was the, what was the worst word? Oh, I have one. Oh, the one about the spring. 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 So instead of turf, you should plant ramelots. No, I mean, well, well, turf. I mean, you probably wouldn't be able to maintain a, a lawn of, of just ramelots, but but your turf grass is a ramelot of a very specific type. So so this is just a catch-all term to describe a large diversity of species uh, that have a grass-like aspect. So it's generic term. What? It's a generic. It's term. a very generic term. Yeah, I was just going to mention if anyone on Zoom has a question, can you just put it in the chat box and we will try and get to you in the next couple minutes if anyone else has questions? I have one more. Yeah. Um, you kept some of those pictures. I was wondering about <laughs> one or two mm -hmm. reference the Badcock Web. Badcock Web Wildlife Management Area. It's in okay. Charlotte County. It's so if you go up I 75 to the Tucker Grade exit. Okay. Uh, and you head east, you'll get to the entrance kiosk of the Babcock Web, the main unit of the Babcock Web Wildlife Management Area. One of the things about Babcock Web is it's one of the most burned areas. So, 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 this, uh, so uh, there's a lady I met from Paul Beach County who, who uh, worked uh, in, in natural areas management, and uh, we actually went last April to, to uh, Babcock Web, and she was telling me that apparently in Peninsular Florida, Babcock Web is like the, the gold standard for, for frequency of burn. I mean, they, 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 there are areas of Babcock Web in order to, and I think it's in order to maintain uh, young shoots, fight, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of regrowth after fire for cattle to browse. So, so, so Babcock Web, uh, they, they, they have several herds of cattle that they, that they raise. In order to provide food for it, uh, it turns out that cattle are really like to have um, 
regrowth after fire. So, so that's one of the reasons why they just burn the heck out of the place. There, been, there are some specific spots that I've seen burn, not just once, but twice within a year. Uh, whether that's on purpose or by accident, I don't know. Um, but but, but uh, uh, one guy I knew who was uh, at the uh, Babcock Reserve said that, that there was a general plan to, to burn that up at the entirety of it um, every three years. And, and I think that they are, uh, at least that is successful of, one, of, of once in three years, if not more. So, so, uh, so, he, so, so that uh, is a, a great place to see Florida um, fire maintained landscapes in a state that might have be um, semi close to, to the way they would have historically existed, where, where there's little shrub cover and it really is mostly very open, brandoid, and, and herb dominated. And just yeah. one question on the same sorry, just uh, uh, if you know or are you aware of any Chapman's oak populations that could be spotted? Uh, what was this second sharing, Chrysopsis? Where is there a good place to see Chapman's oak? Is the first thing. Uh, uh, there is some Chapman oak and the scrub at uh, um, Rippery Bay. Uh, there is no Chapman oak at Railhead. However, in uh, a small area uh, down uh, Wiggins Pass Road towards the coast, there's a, there's a piece of scrub uh, uh, an area that is otherwise going to get developed. And one of one of my Christopher Bowman, who's one of my students, got access to that area, and and it's it's in there. However, you probably shouldn't just press pass it. <laughs> um, so so it's actually it's, it's pretty rare uh, in uh, uh, in Collier County. So so but it is uh, it is at uh, at, um, at Rookery Bay, where it's the probably the southernmost extant. Location. Yes. You can tell I didn't know what any of your words meant about my questions. Um, is there any shade in any of this natural? Because you know, people are always complaining that there's no shade here. It looked to me like there was none. Yeah, there, there, there's very little shade. So, so, so these plants have to contend with uh, really high light intensities. And so it's one of the reasons why you go out and look at plants at that top level, you see all of the the, the herbaceous plants in addition to the, the grasses, everything has got really super narrow skin leaves. Oh. And, and that is, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, is that, uh, um, is that it's going to, uh, because, because the plants aren't shaded, if you have a really narrow leaf, um, it, 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 it's gonna help basically um, uh, with, Allowing the leaf to get rid of extra heat. It probably doesn't spot is word word expire. It probably doesn't give off as much moisture in it. Uh, depending on on the plant, um, uh, it probably transpires a heck of a lot. Actually, okay. I I, I think that 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 uh, and these, these are areas that uh, that pathway is not water limited. Uh, there's high light intensity. Uh, and okay. so high transpiration rates are probably, uh, um, it's probably never been measured. That's actually interesting that to bring that up, but high transpiration rates are probably uh, something that characterizes those, those areas I, I, would, I would expect. They have high net productivity, so high transpiration <laughs> makes sense. And then they make lots of biomass. Uh, other questions. So is that may I? So do you get <coughs> so you kind of take a total surface area, and that's how you know how much transpiration? No, I mean there, there, there are uh, there are a lot of factors that go into uh, an individual plant, uh, whether it's just you want to think of the species, or some some cases an individual a transpiration rate. So so it has to do with the, the density of the stomata and their distribution. Um, uh, hairs that are that are on the surface of leaves. So again, so those the, like the Chrysopsis leaves are white woolly. Um, uh, that it, it is something that can help reduce transpiration rates. Where uh, uh, where basically when plants open up 
and expose their, their stomata. So, so leaves have got little holes in them, called, effectively called stomata. And this, each, each hole is surrounded by a pair of cells called guard cells. And these can open up and allow for gas exchange to occur and CO2 to go in and water to be lost so they can shut up and, and prevent that. So, uh, so <laughs> hairs, what hairs will do, uh, uh, this is, you asked the question about sort of leaf shape or species differences. What, what plants that have those white hairs, what that does is in addition to, to uh, refracting solar radiation, it also creates a locally humid environment around the aperture of the stomata, the outer surface. So therefore, CO2 can be uptaken and the plant isn't going to lose as much water because it's in a locally humid little microscope. So, 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 so it's going to be, it, it, it's a morphological mechanism for drought tolerance. Okay. So a lot of those uh, little uh, tough leaves, shrubs in the scrub have got all kinds of little mechanisms of, of doing this, trying to, to, to uh, increase the relative humidity around their stomata. And as a mechanism, as a way to prevent uh, excessive uh, loss of water through transpiration, high transpiration rates. Thank you. Yeah, if, if, oh, right. if you have any questions, yes. really this is what you get when you have the yeah. plant um, to be out and die. I'm going to think about this. Thank you. We do have a plant raffle if anyone wants to yeah. take yeah. home a plant. Yeah. Whatever okay. you have, your raffle ticket. Mm -hmm. um, for the folks on Zoom, thank you so much for, for joining in. I'm going to go ahead and stop the <laughs> recording and all that.